So now we turn to the Bible and we look in the book of Genesis and very few verses that we're traveling through. And what do we see? Well, first off, if we are going to deal with this pain, um, I would say we need to create, we need to, we need to refuse to allow pain to create a foothold of bitterness. That's huge. That's, that's, that, that is huge. And look with me, if you will. So now what's happened is Jacob is dead, right? Joseph's father. But now we look in verse 19. And now that Jacob is dead, Joseph's brothers begin to worry, right? And so in verse 15, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did. Keep in mind, they've been with Joseph now for two decades. Uh, so they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Now, what are they doing? They're operating out of trauma mode. They're seeing Joseph as an enemy. They've slipped into enemy mode. And what they're doing is they're worried that Joseph is going to now treat them as an enemy of the state. Okay, so what are they gonna do? Well, they're gonna play out, they're gonna be manipulative. They're gonna play on Joseph's heartstrings. So when you're fearful, you get manipulative. And so what are they doing? They're fearful that Joseph's gonna take action on them. So now they're gonna get it manipulative and they're going to basically play on his heartstrings by saying, oh, but this is what dad said, right? What did dad say? Oh, well, dad said this before, you know, he died. Command Joseph, say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Notice what it says. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. In other words, he wept when they spoke to him because he's been hanging out with them for 20 years and they believe that what if he's just been tricking us and, and playing the nice guy because dad's still alive. But now that dad's dead, now the nature's gonna come out. Do you see how skewed they are about human nature? And so an enemy naturally thinks other people are enemies. When you live in the enemy state, you think everybody's in enemy state. The problem is you just don't know which enemy state the others are in. Are they in simple enemy state, stupid enemy state, or intellectual enemy state? And they're thinking, okay, well, what kind of enemy state were Joseph's brothers in when they sold him into slavery? Stupid enemy state. Like, that's really dumb, right? Like, take your enemy, sell him into slavery, all the consequences of that, right? So what kind of enemy state would they think Joseph's in? Well, for 20 years, intellectual enemy state. He's just playing them. Dad's dead. Now we're going to really have at it. We're going to really show them. Do you see the, the, what's happening here in the passage? And when we think about this, it's really powerful stuff for us to be aware of and how we act and how our traumas can show up. And we got to make sure that when these traumas show up, I mean, thank God that Joseph has got a level head because many people, again, they'll turn to medication, they'll turn to sleeping around, they'll turn to addiction. They'll even use humor to deal with it. That's how we'll deal with it a little bit. I mean, I, I kid you not, like we got a pretty corrupt uh, head system rolling in the Conway household. Like, uh, and you know, I think some of it really begins with my dad, right? I mean, he's got this sense of humor uh, and my grandpa has this sense of humor. Like it's very funny, but it can be really dark. And so I can remember when my grandpa, uh, you know, he died and I'm at the funeral, 17 years of age, my heart's crushing. I mean, this was a very brutal moment in my life, losing my grandpa. They lived with us half the year. So we're at the funeral, my grandpa's in the casket and my dad's here, my uncle, my dad's brother, they're just talking. And all of a sudden, myself or my dad got curious about what time it was and my uncle Bill has this crazy wit too. And so he's like, well, I don't know, you know, dad's got a watch on in the coffin. Well, he goes, see what time it is. You know, so we joke around like that, right? So then when my grandma dies, right, my grandma dies, she passes away, or her mouth's kind of, right, like you can already see, like, uh, yeah, you do got a six. And I go up and I take a selfie with my grandma while she's passed on, and we send the picture off to my dad's brother, right? Now you're thinking, boy, oh boy, this is like really bad. My grandma would have been in stitches laughing, Right? And, and so some people go, oh, I can't handle this. I can't imagine it. it. Like, do something really stupid and funny with me, I would say to my family. Like, bury me in a bunch of Vans shoes. Uh, I don't know what you want. Do something really dumb and stupid. I'm not going to care. We use that stuff to lighten up. I remember one time I was in a place so dark, 
so dark that I literally set the date for when I was going to take my life. I had started getting out my life insurance stuff for my family so that they would know where to find it. And I had set the date and I was going to jump off a cliff at the Ritz Carlton in Southern California where I used to work. And that's how empty my heart was. I said, I'm just going to jump, go th- I just want to go, and it's like I've told my family, when I die, spread my ashes over Salt Creek Ocean in Southern California. Uh, that's where I want to be. And when I told my, I was telling my family later about that, what happened when I fell into this horrific space, and I told my son, he starts laughing his butt off at me. And, and I was like, well, what's so funny about that? And he's like, oh, dad, just the thought of it, you wouldn't have cleared the cliff, man. He's like, the hill kind of goes like this. And so he's like, you would have been tumbling down. And he's like, that is so funny, dad. And I'm like, you're right, son. I might not have cleared that cliff. And before you know it, we're dying laughing about like, well, that was a failed attempt. There goes dad rolling down the hill. And so all that to say, uh, we bonded like that in a crazy way. And so... Remember, when you think about this, we started a church to help people with mental health, and you keep coming back, so I assume you want a story on mental health. We're going to lead by sharing our own mental health issues to try to help you understand that we don't have it all together here. But either way, do not let your pain to cause a foothold of bitterness. And so what do we see? Look at verse 19. What does Joseph say? Well, but Joseph said to them, do not fear, for I am in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me. He doesn't minimize what they did. It's still sin. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, right? And then he also says, verse 21, do not fear. I will provide for you. So he doesn't let it turn to bitterness. If anybody had a right to be bitter, wouldn't it be Joseph? His brother sold him into slavery, yet he could see the good out of it. There will be certain challenges that you'll experience in life and you won't understand it. You'll be confused by God. If anybody could have been confused by God, who is it? It's Joseph, the person who was given a dream by God showing him that God was gonna raise him up and someday his brothers will bow before him because he's gonna be in leadership. How in the world did Joseph manage to trust God hundreds of miles away that God would be faithful to fulfill his promise in light the, like God shows these brothers are going to bow down before you and the very brothers he sees in his dreams are the one that sells him into slavery. It looked like the dream died, but he still trusted. Our greatest challenges in life will be, do we still trust when it looks like the dream's dying? I believe there's something mystical that God does in our life. He gives us a dream and then he allows it to look like it's dead or dying. He brings us to the utter brink. Have you ever read Pilgrim's Progress? I read it again this week by John Bunyan. The the journey of going through what it takes to get to paradise, to get to the city. We go through lots of of, of twists and turns and curveballs. And the problem with being control freaks is we think if we can get stuff on paper enough, then we can figure out how to control the future. But the problem is, is God's not impressed with calendars. He doesn't feel bound to keep our plans the way we want. We should make our plans, counting on God to direct us. But don't get bitter when things get turned. Not only that, refuse to allow your pain to cause you to seek revenge. That's what they were worried about, right? Are you gonna seek revenge? But that's not the case. What does he say? If he says, In verse 19, do not fear, for am I in the place of God, right? Am I in the place of God? So in other words, vengeance is of the Lord. God is not looking for us to be vigilantes. God is looking for us to show and demonstrate to the world, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, to demonstrate the gospel, to show the world love, to be merciful to people, to forgive. Now that doesn't mean you don't have a right to talk through your pain. Because what some people will have you believe relationally is, well, if you really forgive me, then we don't have to talk about it. No, no, I I need to talk about it so I can get to a place where I can forgive you. Let's chat, let's talk, let's converse, right? 
And there's different things that we do to not communicate. And be very careful if you struggle with anger or control, be careful how you can use your anger and your control to dominate those in your household in the silence. And have you ever read The Emperor's New Clothes? Angry people walk naked more than non-angry people because people are too scared to tell them that they're undressed. Don't be the kind of person that uses anger so that people will deceive you to make you think that you're something you're not. You know, like think about that. Somebody loves me enough to speak a hard truth into my life to tell me where I need to grow. And yet I don't like that. It makes me feel insecure. So now I'm gonna use anger so that you can tell me what I wanna hear and let me just live in deception. Many people would rather live in deception thinking there's something they're not than to walk in the truth of who they really are. It's kind of coming through right now, right? Yeah, that wasn't scripted. Maybe the spirit of God's helping out right now, right? Yeah, we'll take that, Lord. So as we think about this, we just don't want to end up that way, seeking revenge. Don't stoop to their level, right? As Confucius said, not that I'm endorsing his uh, philosophy as a whole, but his statement's good. Anytime you seek revenge and set out for revenge, dig two graves, right? One for yourself and one for the other because it's going to kill you. Third, refuse to allow pain to blind you toward God's overall purposes. And this is something that you can definitely see that he does such a wonderful job on. And if you look in verse 20, he says this, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about Here's the good, the purpose, that many people should be kept alive as they are today. I love that. He doesn't allow his pain to cause him to not be purposed in life. How many of you are shut down because of pain? You're shut down on your marriage. You haven't served in a church in years because of pain. You haven't, you know, figured out what to do. You're just stuck. You're just at that place where what does life become, right? Don't become like the, the couple in National Geographic where they ran the article and the husband and wife finally retired to Florida and that, what were they doing in their retirement? Well, they were walking along the beach shores collecting seashells. And as John Piper so aptly put, you know, God's not gonna be impressed someday when you stand before the Lord and say, oh Lord, check out my seashells that I collected for you in retirement, right? Like we want our life to have meaning and purpose and God created you for purpose and for meaning. But your pain can stop you from finding purpose. It can shut you down. It can burn you out. It can make you feel empty, insecure, useless, worthless, tired, empty, depressed, addicted, wanting to give up on life and give up on others. It was Viktor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning, spent time in the concentration camps, and he realized as the founder of Logotherapy, that the difference between those who survived the concentration camps and those who didn't, it was those who were in the midst of pain in the concentration camp that could envision a life outside the camp, seeing that their pain could be repurposed later. Those that allowed their pain to remove all their pleasure and to lose any sense of purpose were the ones that were all too ready to die. Be aware that pain doesn't shut you down from believing that life has meaning and purpose. Viktor Frankl says, pain is only bearable if we know it will end, not if we deny it exists. He also said, everything can be taken away from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Fourth, refuse to allow pain to prevent you from exchanging evil for good. And so you see how he's healthily processed his trauma of being sold into slavery and rejection. In verse 21, what do we read? Well, we read, so do not fear. And I love that. They're fearful. It, you know, if he, wasn't an, if he wasn't fully healed Joseph from the pain of being an enemy state, he would have played games with them. Remember earlier, he's toying with them and playing games with them. And I said, that is the result of PTSD. This is a traumatized brain. He's not doing that at this stage, right? He's like, do not fear. He doesn't want them feeling fear. You know, there's, there's a kind of a moment like when we forgive each other, but we still want someone to feel miserable. 
You know you're really free when you don't want someone to pay, when you don't want somebody to, to feel messed up, when you don't want, like when all you're thinking, God will punish that person, God will strip that person, you're still in enemy mode. There's still work of healing and, and, and reconciliation that has to take place, right? And so he's like, don't fear. He doesn't want his brothers living in that fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Wait, you took away everything from me. My father, my upbringing, you took it all. And now Joseph's like, nevertheless, I'm going to use my power for your advantage and I'm gonna bless you. And he takes care of his brothers and his family. Such a cool thought. And then finally, refuse to allow your pain to destroy your belief in God's promises. And so what you see going on in the final verses of the book of Genesis is he would go on live a long life. He would see his grandchildren and great-grandchildren and that he even was able to say, I'm about to die, verse 24, but God will visit you and bring you out of this land that he swore. In other words, he's still trusting in the word of God that they're gonna get out of this land. Like he's still speaking like a prophet. He's not giving up on the naked word of God. He's still believing in God's future promises. All the pain, all the rejection, all the drama he went through, and guess what? He did not let that ruin him. In fact, Joseph is the perfect example of somebody who was mistreated by others and he remained faithful all the way to the end and God still managed to pull off his purpose through his life, even though at times it looked like others interrupted what God had in store. So what can we say about that? Well, I think what Dallas Willard has to say is great. For those who love God, nothing irredeemable can happen to you. Amen. Let's pray. So Lord, we thank you. We do. Nothing irredeemable can happen to us. We thank you for the cross, Jesus, that you took the pain of the cross, the pain of rejection, and you died shedding your blood for us, three days later rising from the grave for our sins. And you took the pain of the world in order to give the world purpose. May we believe in you. In Jesus' name, amen.